Friday, March 25th, 2022, Monaco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. Today, we're going to look at the uh, country that could benefit the most or could be one of the biggest beneficiaries, really, of the uh, switch that's going on around the world as it pertains to globalization and also to the uh, geopolitical uh, instability around the world as well, especially after the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, and also now with the talk of sanctions maybe against China, the world is becoming much more uncertain. Some think uh, it's the end of globalization as we know it. So we're gonna look into that today and, and uh, one of the countries that could benefit the most. And uh, yes, before I start though, I like to say that over the years since I started this channel in late 2015, Many people have asked me uh, where they can buy physical gold and silver. I've never really tried to uh, push people into doing things. I've given them my opinion of what I do, and it's up to them uh, to decide, of course. And uh, I don't uh, mind telling people where to get gold and silver. And I usually tell them to do their homework, especially if they've never uh, bought gold and silver and, and to start small <laughs> to basically buy one or two coins or a bar and see how it feels and if it's something that suits them. And uh, I tell them to do their homework, to uh, search for the best dealer, most reputable dealer that has been around the longest. Uh, and with that, I, I've uh, had a, a promo code with Gold Investments in, in London. They're arguably one of the oldest uh, independent family-run uh, bullion dealers in London, Gold Investments. I started dealing with Mike Temple, the founder of the firm, back in 2002. Uh, I bought my first silver from from Mike Temple and I bought gold of course as well from Mike Temple he founded the firm back in 1981 <laughs> at the top of the previous bull market but uh, they've been uh, going on since then his sons Oliver and Simon run the company now and if you want to contact them all the details are below in all the uh, descriptions all my videos in all the descriptions. And if you uh, tell them uh, my promo code is Maneco64, they'll give you a, a slight discount on your purchases. They will also give you a personalized service. You can actually call them on the phone or you can deal online as well. You can go to Gold Investments to pick up your purchases uh, or they can ship it to you. And I remember during lockdown, Back in 2020, at one point, there were the only uh, bullion dealers in the UK, or one of the only dealers that actually had inventory and were actually shipping things uh, to people. So they're very reliable. Uh, but again, do your homework, uh, shop around, but Oliver and Simon will match any price. If you call them and say, so-and-so is quoting this, they will match that quote. So with that, let's go back to the uh, subject of this video about what some are saying is the end of globalization. And, and just to uh, let you know, the country that I'm going to talk about, it's a country that's uh, important to me because that's where I was born. As many of you know, I was born in Brazil and I grew up in Brazil uh, and my parents lived there probably uh, up until the uh, mid, mid 80s or around 1986, 87. They moved to Switzerland afterwards. And uh, I finished university in Switzerland. I started out in, in Florida University, but uh, I, I was born and I grew up in Brazil. My father was second generation Brazilian, his grandfather went uh, from Italy to Brazil in about 1892. And my mother, her father was Portuguese, so she was first generation uh, Brazilian. And uh, 
One thing about Brazil, many people don't know, it's bigger than the continental United States. So it's a huge country. It's the only country in South America where they speak Portuguese. Many people think Brazilians speak Spanish, but we don't. Very similar language, of course. And uh, I did a video uh, back in February, uh, February 20th, about, about the shift from uh, paper assets to hard assets. And I looked at the major currencies, the G20 currencies, so to speak, how they were doing against gold. And surprisingly, they were all up. Uh, I mean, gold was up against all of them, except the Brazilian real. So I was surprised to see that. And then I started putting two and two together. Well, with all the move into hard assets, Brazil being a very rich uh, country resource-wise, and I'll, I'll show you here why um, in a second. We'll look at uh, Brazil's uh, major, major exports. Share this with you. So here we go. These are Brazil's major exports, uh, crude petroleum, iron ore, refined petroleum, uh, copper ore, soybeans, corn, coffee, soybean meal. So you, you get the idea. Brazil is a resource rich country. It, it also has manufacturing, of course. Uh, see, it's got gold as well. I mean, uh, the, the plane that I flew uh, to Switzerland on a British Airways uh, flight from London to Zurich and back from Zurich uh, to London was manufactured in Brazil by a company called Embraer. Uh, it's, a, it's one of the only manufacturers of airplanes in the world. There's not too many of them aside from Boeing or Bombardier or the uh, other, you know, the uh, Airbus in Europe. So Embraer, uh, a major manufacturer of airplanes, is Brazilian. But as you can see, Brazil has a lot of natural resources. So it is bound to benefit from the shift uh, that's going on from paper assets to, to hard assets. And uh, I've kept track of the currency of the Brazilian currency. And I'm gonna show you here uh, why it's looking very interesting and it's continue, continuing to outperform uh, all the other major currencies. Um, it, it's still, uh, gold is still down four and a half percent versus uh, the real uh, as of yesterday. And uh, it's up, I think the dollar is down over 13%. Uh, against the Brazilian real. So here we go, the chart. And uh, I remember actually telling one of my friends in Brazil uh, around this time here that we had a teacup and that the, the dollar could rise quite sharply against the Brazilian real. <laughs> my friend uh, is actually in the south of Brazil and we used to play golf together and his family have a farm in uh, Paraná which is a very uh, agriculturally rich state. And uh, it was one of those times when luckily uh, I got the call right. And he was like, uh, before I made the call, he said, why do you think you know, the real is going to fall so much? And this was just before 2020. And I said, I, I don't know, but the technical picture is telling me that it is. And uh, I guess the event was COVID and uh, the Brazilian real dropped a lot or the dollar went from, you know, just above four to almost six. And uh, recently when I made the video in February, we were still within this uh, kind of uh, pennant or flag. And uh, I told myself, if we break through here, it could be very bullish, even more bullish for the real. So don't forget that. Uh, this chart going down means the dollar is going down. So yeah, this is a very long-term chart going back about 10 years, but there's still a lot of room uh, for the dollar to drop and the real to, to rise. It will be interesting eventually. I think we'll get to this line here. If we hold this line, 
and uh, maybe the Brazilian authorities and the central bank and government will not want the real maybe to uh, strengthen even more. They might set policy in order to, to accomplish that. But right now, as you can see, the Brazilian real is still the major, uh, the best performing currency of the major fiat currencies. And uh, before I go further here, uh, and I'm going to reference a, an article that I saw yesterday in the FT, and uh, it talks about Larry Fink. I know Larry Fink is the CEO of BlackRock, and BlackRock has been one of the major beneficiaries of the whole crisis we've had. They've been setting policy for the Fed, and we know what they've been doing, but sometimes uh, it's good to uh, listen even to people like Larry Fink. Uh, but I just wanted to give you an idea of some books of, about Brazil. And it's like a, a series of book books. And it's by the same author. Some of them are in, in English, but the other ones aren't only in Portuguese. You might eventually be able to find them in English. And it's by this author here, he's Brazilian, Laurentino Gomez. So the first one in the series is 1808. Uh, the second one is 1822. And the third one is one that I'm reading right now, 1889, uh, almost finished reading it. And uh, I recommend if you want to find out more about Brazil to read these three books. Um, I think 1808 can be found in English. If you Google Laurentino Gomez, uh, uh, English uh, translations, you will find some of these books in English. If you read Portuguese, uh, that's better. Um, and basically, it will give you an idea of what Brazil is all about since the early 1800s. And this year as well, 2022, uh, is the bicentenary of Brazilian independence. And Brazilian independence was not very, not, not very similar to American independence in that uh, it was a prince from the Portuguese royal family that declared independence from Portugal and created uh, the Brazilian empire. And that was in 1882, that was Peter I. And then eventually by 1889, uh, that monarchy or empire was, um, how can I say, uh, deposed. Uh, there was a military coup in 1889 and Brazil became a republic. The reason I'll give you a, a rough idea was that there was a war between Brazil and Paraguay. That's my view. Uh, it, it, some people might think it's for different reasons, but that was in the uh, late 1860s, early 1870s. It was a really bad war. I think it killed almost half the Paraguayan population, even though Paraguay was a small country. And, and by 1889, the Brazilian military, which suffered a lot from that war, was very unhappy with things. And that's one of the reasons they became a republic. So I highly recommend uh, these three books if you want to find out more about Brazil. Uh, and uh, so now to this article in the FT that came out yesterday. And, and I, I thought this was very interesting and it corresponded to what I've been seeing you know, with the, to the Brazilian currency and uh, to, the, in, to the shift from uh, paper assets to hard assets. So here, here's the article and we can go through it. Uh, BlackRock chief Larry Fink says, Ukraine war marks end of globalization. I, I would say COVID trigger that as well. And uh, I would also say that the end of the petrodollar is triggering, triggering that too, because countries are not willing to be pushed around uh, by the petrodollar, by sanctions. So let's go through this here. Boss of $10 trillion asset manager warns about inflation. There you go. Uh, as companies uh, reconfigure supply chains, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine 
will reshape the world, eco world economy and further drive up inflation by prompting companies to pull back from their global supply chains. BlackRock chief executive Larry Fink has warned. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has put an end to, to the globalization we have experienced over the last three decades. Fink wrote in his annual letter to shareholders of BlackRock, which oversees $10 trillion as the world's largest asset managers. Uh, asset manager, sorry. While the immediate result had been Russia's total isolation from capital markets, Fink predicted companies and governments will also be looking more broadly at their dependencies on other nations. This may lead companies to onshore or nearshore. And I guess that's where Brazil comes in. Uh, don't forget, Brazil is basically a European country. Yes, there are African influence. There is African influence in Brazil, and, and there's a lot of mixed race people, but uh, basically it's a European country, uh, just like uh, North America. And uh, that's why I think uh, near shore makes sense, uh, resulting in a faster pullback for some, from some countries. A large-scale reorient, reorientation of supply chains will inherently be inflationary. Well, why is that? Well, because while you reorient the supply chains, it doesn't happen overnight. So the supply chains will be kind of inactive, and that means less supply of things, higher prices. Fink wrote in a wide-ranging 10-page letter that also addressed the invasion's effect on the energy transition and cryptocurrencies, uh, and which updated investors on BlackRock's business lines and the reopening of its main offices. So here's the interesting part, and I'll highlight it, and then we'll move on. We don't have to go through the whole article. I, I'll put a link to this article. Uh, under archive.ph, so you can read it for free. Uh, I do subscribe to the FT. It says the letter did not mention any specific country that would be hurt by the shifts, but Fink wrote that Mexico, Brazil, the United States, or manufacturing hubs in Southeast, Southeast Asia could stand to benefit. Other investors have argued that the, the last uh, group could substitute for China, where BlackRock last year launched a set of uh, retail investment products. So there you go, Brazil, Mexico, and even the United States. Well, the United States as well is very rich in natural resources, uh, you know, very uh, rich in, in other aspects as well. And so is Mexico. So I'm going to stop right here. and. Uh, just speak a little bit about Brazil. Am I trying to say here that uh, the Brazilian people are gonna benefit massively and everything is gonna be honky-dory for Brazilians? And this is more for my Brazilian viewers, I guess. I have a few. I remember growing up, my dad always said, his dad and even his granddad used to tell him, oh, Brazil is the country of the future. And uh, it still is. So, and the problem with Brazil uh, is the management of the country because it's a very wealthy country. It's also the corruption there. I, I know there's corruption everywhere, but especially in Brazil, Brazilians like to cut corners as well. And from reading this book, for example, I found that uh, about 80 or I would say 80% 80, 80 or maybe 85% of the population back in 1889 didn't know how to read or write. Illiteracy was big. So Brazil has had problems, but who knows? <laughs> maybe uh, Brazil's time will come. There's a lot of wealth inequality in Brazil. There's a lot of opportunity uh, in Brazil for entrepreneurs. <laughs> Am I going back to Brazil? Not really. I, I don't think I'm going to go back to Brazil because uh, at my age, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but uh, maybe 
uh, other people could think about going back to Brazil, people, uh, Brazilians that have come to Europe over the, the last few decades, who knows? But uh, now I wanted to cover a little bit some investments that people could benefit from it. And again, this is not investment advice. It's what I'm looking at. Over a month ago, maybe six weeks ago, I spoke about a company that I invested in in Brazil called Vale. And they're one of the biggest companies, natural resource companies in Brazil. So that's still doing well. I bought that the stock. This is an ADR, so it's quoted uh, in New York. I bought it around just below fifteen dollars, and uh, it's doing fairly well. It, but interestingly as well, it has quite a big dividend. Uh, the time at the time I bought it, it was the dividend yield was higher, of course, and it's gone down now because the price of the stock has gone up. So that's a good company. Uh, to look into. And uh, again, this is not advice. This is what I'm doing. Um, and uh, of course, you can look at ETFs. I think in the US, there's a, an ETF for, for Brazil. I'll share this with you in a second. And it's called the iShares MSCI Brazil ETF, e EWZ. And uh, as you can see, it's up 30% year to date. And uh, for my UK viewers as well, the same ETF is ab available in, in the London market. I'll share that with you too. And uh, the code or the ticker code is IBZL. So up 30.3% as well. And uh, I guess also just being long hard assets, commodities, precious metals is uh, a way to uh, be indirectly exposed to what's going on in the world. So indirectly exposed uh, to, to Brazil. So with that, let's uh, look at where the markets are this morning and um, finish off uh, our report. So, I'll, uh, okay, here we go. Uh, so it's 8.32 uh, a.m. London time. So we've got spot gold up just over a dollar at 1958.75. High has been 1964.60. Uh, and the low has been 1953. Looking at the chart here of gold, uh, let's have a look. There's this these old highs here, these are monthly charts and we're coming to the end of the month. So if we can close above like 1965 or even this high here from the previous month at around 1975, it could be quite positive for gold. It's still looking pretty good uh, on the monthly chart, as you can see. Uh, back to the uh, markets then, uh, silver. Uh, did quite well yesterday. Yes, it drifted off towards the end of the day, but it it was up almost two percent at one point. I think right now it's up five cents at twenty five fifty six. The Dow future is down about forty. Uh, Nasdaq down about fifty points or a third of a percent. S and P down point two. FTSE is down half a percent seventy four forty. To the currencies. Uh, we've got uh, sterling unchanged, 131.80. The euro is up 0.2 at 110.17. A uh, dollar is down, uh, coming off now, correcting against the yen. It's down almost two thirds of a percent, 121.54. And the dollar is down 0.1 versus the yuan at 637.55. To the other currencies here, uh, Aussie dollar is down an eighth at 75.04 and the dollar is up about an eighth, just over an eighth versus the loonie at 125.45. And the Kiwi dollar uh, is uh, unchanged, virtually 69.59. Uh, what about the Brazilian real? Well, the Brazilian real uh, doesn't trade 24 uh, hours. So it settled yesterday 
at 487, which is below some key technical levels, as I uh, showed you here in this chart, uh, which was around 490. So to the commodities now. So uh, yeah, WTI crude is down 2%. Crude oil has been very volatile, but still uh, uh, that's the other problem uh, for commodities and, and for the financial system, for the fiat currency system is the volatility. Uh, I was reading that uh, energy traders are begging central banks uh, or governments to help them out because there's so much volatility that they can't cope with the margin requirements. Well, that just goes to show that they're too leveraged. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe we'll go uh, to a world where uh, <laughs> there isn't as much paper, uh, how can I say, speculation. And I'm not saying that speculation is bad, but it it's gone over the top. So I, I, I expect to continue to see a lot of volatility in commodities, but I expect the trend to be higher and higher for commodity prices and lower and lower for, for the petrodollar and its uh, kind of sister currencies of the Western world. Uh, Brent crude is down 2% as well, 113.54. High grade copper is up slightly at uh, 474. So we're just gonna quickly look at the uh, the bond market before uh, we sign off. Look at the uh, U.S. Treasury. See what they're doing overnight. There we go. Uh, we've got the ten-year yield uh, actually on change right now at around two thirty-five. It has been as high as two thirty-eight. So uh, bond markets have have stabilized for now, but uh, the trend there as well is for higher higher yields, uh, I would say, and lower prices. So if, if you enjoyed this video, uh, make sure you hit the like button. Please share it far and wide. Think about subscribing to my channel if you haven't yet. And you can also follow me on Rumble, Twitter, Facebook, and all these other platforms below here. I wish you all a great weekend. Take care. Bye.